Hello, and welcome to the Impedimed webinar series. My name is Joanne Yao, and I am the Vice President of Marketing for Impedimed. Today's webinar is titled Multidisciplinary Oncology Rehabilitation Using Sozo Real World Experience from High Point Therapy. We are honored to have three wonderful panelists joining us today. Lorian Atman, physical therapist and site coordinator with the Deaconess Women's Hospital High Point Therapy. Carrie Claiborne, physical therapist at the Deaconess Women's Hospital and High Point Therapy. And Chelsea Jaworski, director of reimbursement and onboarding with Impedimed. We will start today's webinar with a live presentation from Lorian and Carrie, followed by a question and answer session. We encourage you to participate by submitting questions via the Q&A icon on your screen at any time during the webinar. We will answer as many questions as possible during the next hour, and we'll follow up on any questions that we are not able to address live. We are happy to offer certificates of completion for your participation in this webinar upon request. To request a certificate, you may either respond to your registration confirmation email, email us at info at impedimed.com or contact your impediment representative. All webinars are available for replay approximately one week following the event. You may find them on Impediment's Oncology YouTube channel and make sure you subscribe while you're there. Now I will invite Lorian and Carrie to come on video and begin their presentation. Hi Lorian, over to you. Hello, my name is Lorian Atman. I am site coordinator at Deaconess Women's Hospital High Point Therapy. I am an orthopedically trained physical therapist, but several years ago, I found myself supervising a group of therapists who were passionate about oncology care and lymphedema management. And they brought um, to me these, these wonderful ideas and treatment strategies that really improve patients' lives. Um, and so Carrie is with me today, and she's going to be helping out with some of the clinical side. I'm going to help out with more of the management side and talk about how we got this program going. All right, so we're going to move into evaluating for SOZO. This is really going to be a program to talk about whether or not you need to bring in this type of management program into your clinical practice, how to go about implementing it in your clinic, um, building support, not only within the clinic itself, but within hospital systems and the community. And then finally, we're going to review a case study with results, and we'll do a question and answer. Next slide, please. Okay, so when we first started looking at SOZO, um, Carrie and another therapist brought it to my attention that this existed. And like any good manager, I was immediately skeptical, um, not only about, you know, what exactly is this going to do? How is it going to benefit my patients? And is it something that's going to be feasible to bring into our clinic? Um, so the first thing we looked at was the innovation. Um, we attended webinars just like this to see exactly what SOZO was. Um, what type of clinical research was behind it. Um, once we, we saw those results, we looked at, is this something that we can implement as a part of our prehabilitation program, which really focused on prevention? I was very excited to be able to add a piece that, that so clearly demonstrated a benefit early on and that we were able to you know, prevent something from actually occurring moving from a reactionary rehabilitation to a true prehabilitation model. Sozo was so fantastic about, like Impediment gave us all of this education and support. Um, we were able to ask questions, attend webinars. Anytime I had um, a question pop up, quick email, phone call, resolved very quickly. We were able to then gather a lot of this education and then start distributing it to our patients, which was fantastic. Then, of course, we needed to look at the um, revenue side of things. Is this something that's going to be feasible? Um, just like any hospital system, we have costs associated with delivering care. And I needed to make sure that this was something that would be viable for the long term. Um, once we, we looked at those numbers, and I'll run through how we made that decision, we looked at what kind of cost savings benefit would this be giving the patient? 
it, 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 something that is uh, preventative can sometimes be hard to sell because we are very reactionary in delivery of medical care. Um, but this was one thing that we were able to say, you know, if you can catch this early, you can avoid expenses with wrapping, expenses with the number of therapy visits required. And because we were able to reduce the number of visits or potentially reduce the number of visits a patient would have to come into the clinic, it also became cost savings for the clinic supplies. So that was that many fewer wrapping supplies, lymphedema supplies that I needed to order on a regular basis. Finally, when we looked at other facilities that had implemented SOZO in their clinic, we saw that there was a huge increase in patient satisfaction. Um, these patients are having improved quality of life outcomes. They are preventing something that can really become life altering from ever occurring. Next slide, please. Okay, so how did we go about determining whether or not SOZO would be a viable option to introduce with, to our clinic? I am a firm believer that you should um, under promise and uh, over deliver. So I was able to put together some numbers looking at our prehabilitation program that had already been fledgling, just gotten off the ground with 163 patients that fell into the oncology rehabilitation program. Of those, we broke it down, how many were Medicare, how many were private payer. So without knowing the true landscape of private payer reimbursement, I decided to just look at the Medicare numbers to begin with um, and present those to our uh, reimbursement uh, team and to the administration of the hospital and say, you know, this would be a, a conservative estimate of what we could see reimbursement wise. So we were able to run through those calculations, realize that this would be something that would be viable and in fact, even produce revenue for the clinic, um, which is you know, outstanding to be able to, to go to the board of directors and say, this is something that's gonna help our patients, but it's also something that, that we will be able to give with a, a reasonable uh, return on investment here. Next slide, please. Okay, so this was the biggest um, surprise, I'd say, when we first started the program in August. We've been up and running for six months now. Um, our numbers were much higher than our previously predicted numbers. As soon as word got out in the community among the physicians that we were uh, providing this preventative program, we started seeing an increase in referrals. So as you can see, you know, originally I predicted 65 Medicare patients total, 163 for the entire year. You know, we're doing between 30 and 40 scans, even up to 50 in some cases um, on a monthly basis. So this was a, a big boom for us. The other big surprise was the number of private payers that were actually able to come through and provide reimbursement for our services. That wasn't something that I had initially banked on. So I was extremely happy that we are getting as many reimbursements as, as, as we are. Um, so currently 34 cases have been resolved, which has resulted in over $7,000 in payment from private insurance companies. There's another 118 cases under review. And every week, you know, as I'm emailing back and forth with case reimbursement um, from Impedimed, I'm getting a, you know, this insurance is approving, got approval for this person. Um, so that's been fantastic. I wanna talk a little bit about the case assistance program. So Impediment provides this service where they will help us gain reimbursement from private payers. I simply have to submit um, a little bit of information. They, they provide a form that I fill out. I'll send that in with clinical records um, insurance card, and then they take over and will do a prior authorization or, um, you know, a, attempt to get some type of predetermination for coverage for these patients. You know, meanwhile, we're providing the service to them and they're, they're coming in, they're getting the scans, they're seeing the results from it. So as we are able to talk with some of the private insurance companies, we'll get questions of, well, you know, this isn't something we understand. Can you talk to us about it? Yesterday, I got off the phone with a smaller insurance company. It's like, I really don't understand exactly what you're doing here. And I said, 
the bottom line is, is I'm trying to prevent this person from ever having to come in five days a week for wrapping. And we are trying to keep them from ever developing chronic lymphedema, which is going to be a lifelong condition. That was all I needed to say. She said, absolutely great. This is, I'm gonna send it on for medical review. We'll have the answer to you very shortly. Um, but all of this starts with that case assistance program and the reimbursement team at Impediment. They do all the heavy lifting for that. I just have to respond with the occasional questions um, and, and the information that they ask for up front. Next slide, please. So clinical implementation is actually integrating the SOZO into our prehabilitation. For this part, I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie. Um, Carrie is a fantastic oncologist, uh, oncology physical therapist. She is dedicated to her patients and she is a big reason that our program has been so successful. Carrie. Thank, thank you, Lorian. Next slide, please. So we were fortunate enough to already have a prehabilitation program already established prior to adding in SOZO um, as one of our tools. And so basically um, we had already kind of established this before and we're trying to utilize it, um, working with physicians and the different nurse navigators and support staff. But then when we got the SOZO, like Lorian said, we just really hit the ground running. Um, so how our prehab kind of works is we see patients for a 45 minute evaluation and we prefer this to be before surgery, um, but certainly right now we're using within the first 90 days. Um, I will have to say establishing that baseline prior to surgery, though, has been really, really helpful. Some patients have a negative LDEC score, some have a positive LDEC score, and it's really hard to judge that change that would trigger that compression garment if we are not having that baseline. So I've been really, really encouraging patients, please let us see you before that surgery. Um, the same goes with chemo or radiation, but I think the surgical aspect has been the, the, the main one. So at this visit, what we're doing is we're establishing our baseline. We're taking that SOZO measurement. We're getting that LDEX baseline. We're also going ahead and taking circumferential measurements, looking at range of motion, strength. What is that patient's function? We're having them go ahead and fill out outcome tools. Um, those typically are going to be our fact G, which we use because it's going to encompass all the different aspects of that cancer patient. And then if it's one of our breast cancer, we're looking at the dash. Of course, if it's one of our female cancers for lower extremity, we're looking at the LEFS. Um, with the SOZO, we can also look at BMI. We know that BMI can play a factor in increased risk of lymphedema as well. So this just gives us an idea of where is this patient starting? I will say this has been really, really helpful too, because I find it's been less overwhelming for the patient to have this visit, to be able to talk about things, for them to get their questions out. Um, at this visit, we're able to give them education. What is lymphedema? We're able to explain it, show them kind of what their risk factors are. We're able to talk to them about what to expect after surgery. Um, what would the exercises that we would recommend? Um, what you should do if you have drain tubes versus if you don't have drain tubes? how you should follow the plastic surgeon's recommendations if you're having the reconstruction immediately. So we're able to just open up a whole bunch of different options for the patient. Um, we're able to set our rehab goals and see what their goals are going to be post-surgery. You know, sometimes we have a patient that maybe I just want to be able to hang my clothes back up or do my hair. And then you might have, we've had a patient this summer that was a triathlete, wants to get back to that. So we can kind of see what that relationship is going to be. Um, and then I think the biggest thing is we give them their card. Our card has our email address on it, our phone numbers for the clinic. And we say, please call us if you have any questions. I think this is really important for those patients that are having neoadjuvant chemo, because if they're having that chemo, they may not be returning to us for several months before they actually have the surgery. Um, so this has just been really, really helpful to go in ahead and establish that relationship with them. Next slide, please. So at this visit, we also tell them, hey, we're gonna see you three weeks after your surgery. For those patients, like I mentioned, having neoadjuvant chemo, they may not know when their surgery date's gonna be. 
that's okay. Give us a call. Get on the schedule three weeks after. Um, at this visit, we're going to have them redo, redo those outcome tools. So that fact G, that dash, we're going to also go ahead and redo our SOZO scan. Um, if they have drain tubes, then we are making note, hey, this is with this patient's drain tubes. Um, that are present. There's all kinds of little things that you can add to the SOZO to kind of help benchmark this is what this type of patient is. Um, we're going to look at posture, pain, cording. Are they able to dress? Um, what are those range of motion um, restrictions? And anything that we can have to help them postoperatively. In this, we're also establishing this goals. So for some of these patients, they may be doing well, and we're just going to recommend that they come back at that three-month post-op visit. For other patients, they may have some myofascial restrictions. They may have some chest swelling. They may have some cording. They may have pain. Any of those things, then we're going to go ahead and schedule them according to what we feel they need at that place in time. Next slide, please. I'm going to go ahead and pass this back over to Lorian about, I think we're going to do this kind of together about building our support and our clinical leadership and non-clinical roles. So we were able to find a physician champion who really got behind the program. I think I saw a question in the chat about, you know, how did you get buy-in? And that was really, really key, um, getting a physician that understands what you're trying to do and the importance of doing it. Um, finally, collaborating with the nurse navigators, those people are hugely important, making sure that they understand exactly what this program is um, for and allowing them to, to you know, have contact information. They can get a hold of us at any time. We will get messages from them. Um, can you explain again exactly how does SOZO work and what happens if their insurance doesn't cover it? How do you handle that? We go through that information and that, that has definitely helped with, with navigating the referral process. Um, finally, um, I think it's important to collaborate with your physician office managers as well, so if you can get meetings with them. I sat down with the physician um, office manager at our local breast clinic who described the program, described exactly what we wanted to use SOZO for, and she was so excited about just being able to have this in the area. Um, I think it's her goal that, that she'll have a machine herself in, by the end of the year and make those initial scans and then be able to refer to us for follow-up and follow-through. Um, and then finally, just the fact that we have therapists that were already very involved in the oncology community. They were a part of committees. They were part of both physician groups and patient groups. Um, that they were able to start talking about this months before we even got the machine. So I'll turn that back over to Carrie. Yes, so like Lorian said, we were fortunate enough prior to having SOZO to already have these established relationships. I had already been um, involved in quarterly meetings with um, a lot of our referring group um, that included the breast leadership groups, oncology committee groups. Um, so in these quarterly meetings, months, I mean, pretty much as soon as we decided we wanted to try to get it, I started talking about it and bringing it up in every meeting, um, which I knew had a lot of our key referring people as well as support staff in it to say, hey, this is something we're wanting to do. And then once we knew it was happening, hey, this is coming. This is what this is going to be. This is why this is going to be so important. Hey, just a reminder, Sozo is coming. Um, we had a little bit of a delay in getting the machine. So I think for six months, they got used to hearing me say, Sozo, 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 when are you actually getting this? Um, but it worked out really, really well. Um, and then that also kind of led the lead in for us to be a part of our multidisciplinary group. So we're really, really fortunate. Um, myself, and other therapists, Dusty, um, we go on Fridays and this multidisciplinary group is where the patient gets to meet their team of doctors. So that'll include the surgeon, the radiation oncologist, plastic surgeon, nurse navigators, um, 
genetics. And so we actually get to meet them at that visit and go ahead and talk to them about our prevention program, about the SOZO, about our oncology rehab services. And this has been huge. Um, you know, physicians at first were a little worried, is this going to be too overwhelming? It's already an overwhelming day for the patients. But this was something that I think it's all in how you approach it. And they're almost excited to see a physical therapist come in because that's a little bit less intimidating than one of the other physicians. And so um, I feel like sometimes I'm kind of the icebreaker to say, hey, you know, this is what we do. The big thing that we hear from patients is we didn't know these services are available. So we wanted to let you know sooner and what you to choose to do with it is up to you. Next slide. This is back to Lorian. Okay, so building support. Uh, there are a lot of pieces that have to go in place for this to work right. Um, one of them is IT. You need to make sure it's going to network. Um, you can hook everything up. The security is set up. And if it's anything like our hospital's IT department, you think you get a hold of the right person and you bring them into a meeting with impediment and we start talking and they say, well, actually we need this person that's in charge of security. So then you've got to bring that person in. Um, so it was multiple meetings, but everyone at impediment was great. And we would reschedule and make sure everyone that needed to be at the table was at the table. This was also where we began to develop the playbook. Um, the playbook is something that Sozo was insistent that we needed, which I, I can now, looking back, completely see why. And it was basically a how-to instruction of how we are going to implement and build this program from the ground up. And it included every piece. Um, people that I didn't even know I needed to be talking to impediment said, hey, you need to get this person and bring them to the table. What about, what about this group? Um, so as that playbook began to grow, we began to fill in the pieces, the program really began to take shape. Um, so uh, getting your IT people involved, making sure that you get their questions and concerns answered is very important. Finally, um, we looked at the compliance. Uh, we had to have a business associate agreement in place. Um, we have to make sure that all of the PHI that we're sharing back and forth is protected. What type of equipment is going to go into that? What does that look like? So all of those pieces were laid out in the playbook ahead of time, which the compliance department loved because they had a roadmap of exactly how things were going to happen um, and, and what practices we were going to follow to make sure that we were in compliance with every regulatory body that we have to be at the hospital. Um, finally, we decided not to allow impediment to have access to our EMR. That was a decision from our compliance department. So that means that I have to maybe do one extra step in communicating with that case assistance team um, that Impedimed provides. So rather than Impedimed accessing our EMR to see who is coming in for SOZO scans and then beginning that case assistance program all on their own, I do have to initiate that as clinic manager. So it, like I said, it's a piece of paper that I fill out and send in with the clinical reports and information. It's just one extra step. Um, maybe your compliance department will be on board with them accessing the EMR and that will be even easier for your clinic. Next slide. Okay, reimbursement specialists. I was fortunate to have a reimbursement specialist um, that I work well with that really took a special interest in this. She attended um, impediment webinars with me, just like this one, asked questions I didn't even know needed to be asked. Um, there are so many rules that exist around reimbursement, depending on location, depending on the type of person that's doing the billing. Is this a therapy clinic? Is it a physician's office? Um, is it a clinic setting? Is it a hospital setting? Facility charges, all of those things. She worked through with the impediment people to get all of that lined out and in the playbook ahead of time. Um, we did that early on. We, we probably did that before we actually even knew that we were going to be getting the machine. And I think that was important because it really allowed me to have a great understanding of what the reimbursement picture was going to look like. So when I submitted for um, approval from our board of directors for this machine, I was really able to lay it all out. And then as they were coming up with questions, we were able to answer those. And the uh, 
billing specialists. They continue to work with impediments team. They get together on a regular basis and talk through cases. There's emails that go back and forth weekly and, and monthly just to make sure that we are staying on track and capturing the charges that we should be. Next slide, please. Finally, your front office and reception folks. Um, we brought them in right before we began to um, implement the program. We had them attend the onboarding and orientation with the machine with us. I thought it was very important that they hear exactly what we were doing. And then Impediment helped me come up with some common questions um, that patients will have. We printed those up with answers and they are laminated and sit at our front desk. So if somebody calls in with a specific question, our front office is able to start navigating um, and getting them answers right away. And of course, if it gets too clinical, then they bounce it to the therapist. Next slide. Finally, our marketing team. Um, again, Impediment provided us with a lot of materials to begin with. So we were able to take those, add our branding to them, tweak it for our program, and then put them out in the community. Um, our marketing team was also fantastic about just thinking outside the box. So we did uh, podcasts, we did webinars, we did Facebook, you know, lunch and learn lives. Um, of course, all of this was happening during COVID. So we didn't get to do our big live presentation that we had. We had put it all together. We thought we were going to get to do it. And then all of a sudden local numbers went up and we weren't able to. So um, but we were able to utilize quite a few of Impediment's marketing materials, and, and that was fantastic. Um, I think, Carrie, you probably even have some incidents where patients came in and was like, what's this? Why, why don't I know about this? Yes, exactly. That's what I was getting ready to say. Um, ironically, Lorian was talking to me, I think it may have been about this webinar the other day, and I was working with a previous breast cancer patient of mine for a completely different diagnosis. But when she came in, she knew me really well, and she said, what is this? And held up her phone and it said, you know, impediment with the Sozo. She was like, what is this? What is this machine? Why do I not know about it? And why haven't you done this on me? And I started laughing and I said, well, we didn't have it when you were coming. I'm more than happy to implement it at any time um, for that. We can do that. But this is what it is. And what she had done, I guess she was discussing our clinic um, to a family member or something like that. And they had either searched my name or searched our clinic, High Point, and that had popped up. I don't know if it was the podcast or if it was our website or what, but it immediately triggered her um, wanting to know more information. And then also kind of touching on this marketing, um, like Lorian said, we are super fortunate to have awesome marketing staff to work with us and take any ideas we have. But Impedimed's brochures were phenomenal. Um, myself and the other treating therapists were able to go through and kind of handpick what we wanted and have our branding put on it. That's actually what we use to give out to patients. Um, when patients come for their prehab, they receive a folder from us. It's going to have that information in it. When we go to multidisciplinary clinic and we are trying to explain what is Sozo, um, we have that. And it has a picture of what the machine is. It also has a picture of what um, the LDEX looks like and what that means. So we're able to describe, okay, this is what normal would be. This is what test would be. This is what the trigger would be. And what would we do with that? Um, so it's been really, really helpful. And like Lorian said, not having to reinvent the wheel you guys have, you know, impediments already done this. So to take that information and handpick what we want to utilize. And then we've even made some adjustments. You know, the handouts that we initially thought we would use, we're like, you know what, this, this is better for patient education. So we've switched to some different ones and they've been wonderful at helping us with that. Okay, so overcoming the challenges. One of the challenges, of course, is going to be your commercial insurance reimbursement. If you work with Impediments reimbursement team, and I would say I dedicate maybe an hour a week doing that, um, that they are able to get the reimbursement um, for those private insurances at a rate that allows this program to be more successful than we had originally planned on. Documentation. Um, there is very little additional documentation that is needed 
in your therapy notes to get SOZO covered. We're talking about you know, a minimal amount of information that Carrie's gonna go over with you um, that she adds to her notes. Patient follow through. Now, this is something that in the best laid plans, we know exactly when a patient's coming in for a SOZO scan. We know that we, we want them to come back in and we know that if we catch it early, so we get them on a regular schedule, they're gonna have better outcomes. We provide that education for them up front and throughout their treatment. However, it is ultimately a tool that your patient is going to use or not use, and they can decide that. So we've certainly had a few that said, you know, I got my first scan, maybe they came in for their second, they're really not ready to schedule the third scan. Um, so that's fine. They know where we are, they know to call, and we've even had one of those that did call back in and said, you know, my arm is starting to feel a little heavy. I think I, think I am going to go ahead and, and schedule that scan now and, and gone ahead and got the the um, six month scan. So really truly providing the education, the information, which SOZO does a great job of helping you put together, um, gives them the tools to make a, a decision for themselves. But just providing this service is giving them an option that you know we didn't have in this community ahead of time. And I'm really excited that we were able to do that. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie for the case report. This is all her. All right, next slide, please. So this is an example of a patient. Um, now this is not our typical patient that came for the initial visit prior to surgery. Um, this was a patient that I started seeing right before we received the machine. So she had a left mastectomy on 728. I think we got our machine on 82. Um, so this patient still had drain tubes present, um, receiving chemo, knew that she was going to have radiation coming up. So um, the big thing here is just that we were documenting that what she was having done, she had axillary lymph node dissection. If we have the amount of lymph nodes, so um, at this point in time, we were documenting our bioimpedance up with our procedure codes. Our own documentation system and billing has had to change that, but that's going to be unique to each company. So next slide, please. The main thing that is really, really important with the documentation is with SOZO, you are able to do it sitting or you can do it standing. So we always wanna make sure that however we are testing it, we're doing in the same position to be specific. So you can kind of see right under the objective there, we're putting what position, standing, um, what we're doing, arm or leg, are we doing unilateral, bilateral? Um, what is the at-risk side, the involved side? What is their dominant hand? Hand, and then what their LDEX score is. And then is that their first scan? So we're going to consider that their baseline or where are we at with this? So in this, you can see that her original scan is 14.1. Um, unfortunately, we don't have what her baseline is. But in this particular circumstance, um, this is still really, really helpful information for her. Next scan or next slide. <laughs> All right, so this also shows how we documented again what the LDEX score is, that this shows patients at high risk and will benefit from a preventative sleeve. We're checking coverage through the DME. Um, so just our circumferential measurements, our range of motion measurements, our strength measurements. Next slide. So this is probably the most important thing. This is actually her SOZO scan. So you see August 3rd is when we saw her. So I guess we saw her the second day after we got the machine. So that was with drain tubes. And so I went ahead and re-scanned her again once she had the drain tubes removed and it was a little shy of a month. So we're back at nine now, which is awesome. Okay, and then we went ahead and, um, Sorry, my slides cut off here, so I'm looking. So then I also re-scanned her back again on December 6th, and she was back up at 11.3. So what is kind of interesting about this, and I was telling the ladies when we were going through this, is this is definitely a patient. Um, her insurance does not cover compression garments, um, which we definitely see with our Medicare population. Um, this is someone that I was 
probably not had seen, would not have seen already at this point if we weren't getting her so soon from doing our multidisciplinary and starting the prehab program. So that initiated getting her a compression garment sooner. That is also something where this patient, she did not have the financial resources, but she does have a really good family support. So we were able to look at options of how can we get a compression garment this is what we're looking at. We don't have your baseline, but we know that you can get down to nine and now you're back up again. Um, she was having some heaviness. She was having some achiness in that arm. I knew she was gonna have radiation coming up. And so we were able to go ahead and she was able to reach out to her family and her resources. And we were able to get her a compression garment ordered. Um, and this is something that I ordered it probably sooner than I would have had I just been going by circumference differential measurements and had I not had the SOZO to kind of help guide us. Um, since then, we have continued kind of back and forth with her compression garment. She had a really rough batch with radiation. Um, so that really set her back as well. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have any other scans of that, but go ahead, next slide. This is a, another patient of mine that um, this is a true pre. So saw her October 26th before her surgery, saw her November 23rd following her surgery. So we've had it started at a negative 0.8 up to a 3.1. And then um, I would not have scanned, well, she was right at her three months. So we went ahead and rescanned her. But what prompted that was she came to me and said, Hey, Carrie, um, I need to come back and see you. My forearm's really been like achy and a little bit different color. Um, I don't think there's any infection. It just feels different. And it definitely looked like she was having some pitting going on and some changes there. So then we hopped on the Sozo and surprise, she's up at 13. So so this was a really, really visual way, good visual way for her to see the progression of this is where we started. This is where we were at post-surgery. This is where we're at now. Um, so we were able, she did already have a compression garment because she is one that had wanted to get one. She knew she would be flying in the future and wanted to travel. Um, so I said, okay, let's go ahead. We need you to wear your compression garment every day, remove at night, and then we'll rescan. Unfortunately, she is about week two of that. So I do not have her follow-up measurements. I need to do that in about two more weeks. Um, but I felt like this was a perfect picture of kind of how we're utilizing it, triggering and implementing getting compression garments sooner. Next slide. Lorian, back to you. Okay. So we feel like the, the addition of SOZO has really given teeth to our prehabilitation program. Giving a patient a copy of the scan so that they know, here are your numbers. It just becomes, it, it, it becomes real in their mind, not something that we're just talking about, something that could potentially happen in the future. This is something that we're actively monitoring. Um, it really becomes a trigger for them to be a little bit more active in that prehabilitation program. Um, implementing it has been really simple for us as far as getting the physician buy-in. As soon as we explained what we were doing, why we were doing it, they were on board. Um, implementing it in, as far as space becomes very, very simple. It is the size of a scale. It does not take up any additional room, um, which we are, and I know several clinics are, very starved for space. So that has not been an issue. And reimbursement can be achieved even with private insurances with just a little extra effort, um, as long as you're utilizing impediments tools for their predetermination program, uh, their appeals processes, and their already done marketing materials. All right, well, I think I am done with everything, but I'm sure that you guys have some questions, so. Thank you, Lorian. Thank you, Carrie. That's a wonderful presentation, and we are getting a lot of questions. I'd like to invite Chelsea to join us as well. So um, we're going to start asking questions. Again, if you have any to ask, please go ahead and submit them using the Q&A icon on your screen, and we will dive right in. Um, you know, we're getting a lot of billing questions, um, and then we're also getting a lot of questions around how you implemented 
with a prehabilitation and within multidisciplinary. And so I'm going to ask you guys to talk a little bit about um, kind of this is this is an area that comes up for a lot of our users, which is how do you get that physician buy-in? How do you convince them to send you prehabilitation patients? And um, are you meeting with every single individual one-on-one? -on -one? Could you revisit that approach? And also, you know, maybe the impact um, and the progress you've made with your prehabilitation program as well. Okay, well, so we are fortunate, like I said, to have already had several things, relationships established. Um, Lorian has been phenomenal and I think I've been at this clinic for four years at knowing you've got to put in the time to make those personal relationships with the key pieces and meet with them. So prior to COVID, I was able to go and have meetings with um, nurse navigators, social work, all the different referring pieces to really work together. And then that led to being invited to these quarterly meetings for breast survivorship, um, oncology committee, and all of that, which a lot of that has been virtual, but it's still good because you're going to have surgeons, oncology, and then all the other little, um, not little, because I feel like they're the most important ones, but all the other resources for the patients that are available that they're talking to. Um, so then the key pieces, we were already in, so that really, really helped. And then Lorian going to the practice manager of one of the main surgeons and basically saying, hey, here's what we want to do and here's why. And I would say that um, surgeon really, really has a lot of pull and multidisciplinary. Um, and then a chance meeting of our other therapist, Dusty, at a... Um, community gathering and <laughs> happened to sit at the same table <laughs> as that physician and was able, like, didn't realize who he was, but they just decided to start talking and then decided to start talking about different services and how we're going to other surgical groups, which led to, well, how come you're not coming to our surgical group and how do we do that? And let's make this happen. So I'd say a little bit of magic, a lot of preparation beforehand. So now that we are established in the multidisciplinary group, um, that does incorporate different surgeons, different radiation oncologists. It's a different rotation every week. When we are meeting with those patients, it is one-on-one. -on -one. And that time could vary anywhere from two minutes because we're the little ones on the totem pole. If the doctor needs to come in, we're going to be pushed out to, hey, they're sitting here waiting for hours. The doctors haven't been in, so we can have as much time as we want. So it kind of varies on the day, depending on who needs to be seen and how many people need to be seen. So that's been huge because they're already meeting us. They're already having a face to the name. Um, I will have to say patient buy-in is a little bit helpful too, because um, I am a survivor myself. And one of the other therapists is also a survivor that works with us. So um, a lot of times that does get disclosed. Um, and that's always followed with, you know, everyone's journey is different, but sometimes I think patients are relieved to see that myself, I may have a compression garment on one day and I may not, and they're relieved to know that I'm using the SOZO to help my, manage my lymphedema, to which I'm asked, am I on it every day? And I'm not. <laughs> but, um, so yes, we are at a fortunate thing to be able to see majority of the patients one-on-one -on -one prior to meet them. But then there's also like a case where um, we were sick and unable to attend Attend. And so our nurse navigators then were proactive in describing our services and going ahead and making those recommendations for the patients with those referrals. Thank you, Carrie. And when you get those referrals, one of the questions we're getting is um, a couple things. Where is SOZO located? You know, do you have one in the cancer center? Is it only in rehab? Is there sharing there? And then the other piece is, of course, you know, to be able to get reimbursement for LBEX, it does require physician uh, oversight or at least a qualified medical professional. So who, how, do, how are those referrals handled to help support the documentation for billing? 
So we get the referrals from the physicians for them to be a part of our prehabilitation program to include SOZO. Um, once we get the referral, we call them, set up the appointment, we try to get them in pre-surgery. Um, then once they come into the clinic, it is part of an initial evaluation, which is a traditional physical therapy evaluation. And when we do that, um, the LDEX is billed through the 93702 CPT code because it is given by Carrie or Dusty or one of our other therapists. Once um, that bill is, is dropped, then that triggers me to fill out a case assistance report if it's not Medicare, straight Medicare, if there's any private insurance involved. And so then impediment takes over with the predetermination or um, getting, getting the coverage um, taken care of. So then at that point, I get to be pretty hands off and that's done. Um, the other piece that I just want to add a little bit to what Carrie was saying, that I think when you're talking about physician buy-in, you really need to focus on how much this benefits the patient both now and later. I think a common refrain that we heard prior to bringing Sozo was, I don't want you to scare my patients. Please don't talk to them about lymphedema. That's just scary. They, they are scared enough. Um, so the way that we approached it and the verbiage that Carrie uses in describing what we do was really important. And the other thing is um, passion, right? Uh, the therapists are very passionate about this and that comes across in when they're talking to physicians and when they're talking to patients. Thank you, Lori. And now maybe we could dig into the reimbursement a little bit more. Chelsea, we're getting some questions about what's the code, um, what does it take to get it billed, how many LDEX, you know, tests can you, will insurance cover in a year? Um, some people are saying they're struggling, they can get Medicare, but not make Medicare Advantage. Could you talk a little bit about the coding aspect, some of those points and, and how the case assistance program works? Sure. On your end? No problem. So, uh, you know, just as Lorian said, the CPT code is 93702. That can be billed under regular physician billing or under a facility tax ID number. And I believe that is how uh, Lorian at High Point bills it out under the facility tax ID. That's how it is paid. Um, when we do initiate, and it's highly recommended that we initiate pre-determinations, pre-service reviews for all of these cases, it's better to ask for permission than ask for forgiveness. So that's why we do pre-determinations, despite some of the medical policies. When we do the pre-EDs, we initiate for at least a year's worth of assessments. So if your protocol is to do it quarterly, we will initiate that for four tests. We, have, we are tracking all the trends from all the commercial payers. When they do provide coverage upon first level appeal or even predetermination, we are seeing them uh, provide it for that entire year. Thank you. And how does it work between, it sounds like you interact with Lauren, you, you and your team interact with Lorian a lot. What are some of the things that um, High Point has done to get so much success? You know, we, uh, we interact I don't want to say too often, you know, we, we, we know how busy they are, um, but there is necessary information. Sometimes some of the commercial payers require a patient's signature to submit an appeal. So we need, you know, just ask them to reach out to the patient, get their signature. Um, we work very close with their revenue cycle team. So they provide us a monthly report of all of the uh, payments and or denials. So then we can go and uh, initiate post-claim denial appeals as well. For those same patients that perhaps we didn't initiate previous predeterminations, we will then initiate predeterminations for any future data, data service as well. Thank you. Now, what's been your experience, Lorian, from um, working with the case assistance program? So for me, I communicate best through email. It's the best way for me to keep track of what's been done. So they made note of that. And now I guess email, um, they'll email me questions. I email off the case assistance reports. Um, if there are any anomalies, they'll send me an email and say, hey, can we schedule a time to talk? They're always very respectful of my time. So, you know, it's been a very, very smooth system. Um, as we went through the first batch, we, we realized that it became easier to identify which patients were actually SOZO patients versus maybe some of them were just prehabilitation 
because they had a pacemaker or there was something else that caused them to not get the SOZO scan. So we ended up pulling that out on our schedule. So it was a little bit easier for me to see and track. Um, yes, we do try to get them the case assistance information ahead of time. That isn't always the way it works out. Sometimes it is after that first scan is done and uh, Chelsea's team is right on it. They, they get the predetermination. And the way our billing cycle works is we don't usually drop charges until the end of the month. So it is actually still fine. It's working out where the uh, case assistance gets started, the predetermination gets started before the insurance is actually receiving the bill. Thank you, Lorian. That's fantastic. Now, Carrie, I wanted to ask a couple more questions about um, SOZO, because we're getting a lot of questions about what you're doing clinically. So can you talk a little bit about your follow-up protocol with SOZO? Because you talked about you do your three-week post-op visit, and that is just kind of standard even before you had SOZO. But then, of course, there's continued evaluation and, of course, the quarterly testing with SOZO as well. So how do you reconcile those and what is your SOZO, longer-term SOZO protocol? So our longer-term SOZO protocol is to be, you know, ideally the pre-visit <laughs> and then the three-week post-visit around then and then three-month, six-month, nine-month, a year. So we know that they're highest risk of developing lymphedema in that first one to three years. So we really try to follow kind of what Sozo and Impedimed has already established with that. Of course, that's up to the patient. All we can do is say, here's the information. This is why it would be beneficial. And then it's up to them. Now, that being said, Dusty and I, you know, if you get the trigger at a point, so let's say on the patient that I was showing the scan of um, that just triggered, and so she's at her three month, we're going to have a one month visit from then, which will be in two weeks now, because it was triggered. So at that point, if she goes back, everything's back in the normal range, my recommendations will be to see her as needed, and for her to use her compression garment as needed, and to schedule that six month visit. Um, and that's ultimately up to her. Now, some of these patients, like this patient is actually just starting radiation and is still having some myofascial and cording issues. So I anticipate that she will still be following up with me some point in between that three and six month part, but it's really gonna be patient specific. So it's gonna be, you're going to address them, you're going to evaluate them just like you would any other patient. This is just that additional tool to use. And then we noticed you're also doing circumference measurements. You, um, would you say it again? I think you're also doing the tape measure circumference. We are, yes. How do you reconcile that information with the SOZO measurements? How do you use those together? So I think the circumferential is something Dusty and I went back and forth. Do we still do it? Do we not still do it? And then we kind of get a little old school and we're like, oh, I still feel like I need to do it. <laughs> so um, those circumferential measurements are usually redone with our progress evaluation. So every 30 days, if the patient is coming in, or if they're just coming in for a SOZO scan, then that's it. That's just a scan, um, unless the patient is wanting a visit with it. Okay. Okay. And I'm trying to just look through the Q&A to see what else is coming up. Go ahead, Lorian. I'm not sure I answered the, um, there was a question about whether or not the cancer center had their own SOZO scan. They do not. So we, as a hospital system, decided that this was going to be a trial run. It was just going to be in the therapy department. So it lives in our therapy gym. Um, and the cancer center is very jealous. They do want their own. So I think that is on the, the horizon in a year or two. Um, one of the hangups is it just didn't fit well into their billing system. They couldn't, they haven't, they haven't figured out of how they're going to integrate that. For us, it was seamless. I know we already are dropping these CPT codes. It fit right into our, um, you know, our documentation. It was a quick, um, I want to say process to get the CPT code added to our billing system, to our documentation system. So we were ready to do it right away. 
whereas they're going to work through their process um, after they wanted to see how successful it was. So, you know, it's my hope that we're able to grow this program and have it in a few of our other therapy clinics across the tri-state area, um, as well as at the cancer center. As far as who funded it, it did, um, the funding came from the hospital system. We are a hospital-based clinic. So I had multiple um, hoops to jump through with board of directors, uh, business administrators, reimbursement specialists, the comptroller, all of those people. And I had gotten them all on board through, let me take you to lunch. Let me explain what we're doing here. Let me show you some of these numbers kind of ahead of the bigger meetings. And so having those key people in my corner when we sat down in front of the bigger board was, was nice. Nice, Lauren, that's wonderful. Um, I'm getting some questions here about timing. So a number of folks are coming in saying, sometimes there's a very small window between diagnosis and surgery. Um, there's a small window between the appointment and the charge dropping. So um, I, I, I wanna ask Chelsea first and then ask Carrie. So Chelsea, if, if someone's involved in your program to do predeterminations, can you talk about the timing aspect and when it needs to be initiated, how long it takes, um, get us, give them a sense of that? Sure, you know, every site that I work with, we develop a very specific workflow. Um, so as, as Lauren stated, they don't drop their charge until the, for a few weeks after they um, see the patient. Others, you know, can drop the charge within 24 hours, 48 hours. So as long as you see that patient and you send the information to us that same day, because it has to be at least the same date of service, we can still initiate that predetermination. If you send, um, you know, they have the assessment and you send it the next day, we can no longer do a predetermination, but we can definitely assist with a post-claim denial appeal. The predetermination process, you know, every payer is different. Um, I would say, you know, three days for maybe Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield and upwards of 10 days for United Healthcare. If that predetermination comes back denied, we automatically go to the first level appeal. And then second level appeal, external appeal if necessary, but hopefully we won't have to get to that. So Chelsea, let's say that you initiate predetermination on day one. Mm -hmm the system charges insurance on day three, and you get a positive response from the insurance company on day 10. <laughs> yeah. So then what do you, how do you handle that? It's, well, we, you know, we provide that information um, to the designated person that we've built out in the workflow, um, that authorization number. Then if, when they do get that denial, right? Because perhaps we did, they didn't submit it with the authorization number. When they get that denial, they can automatically resubmit that with the authorization number. Okay, and, and you work that completely with that revenue cycle team in advance. Most definitely, yep. And we work with them on a monthly basis. Thank you, I think that provides a really good explanation. Now, Carrie, um, I have a number of people saying, listen, I just don't get prehab. Um, I, you know, I either don't get the referrals or we don't have the time. Do you mandate prehab for everybody? What do you do if you don't get to see that patient? You know, like I said, treatment? if we don't get to see them, then our goal is within that first 90 days. Uh, the baseline is huge, but we can also utilize SOZO for our pre-existing patients, those patients that have already, you know, just like the first example, the patient, I didn't technically see her for prehab, so I don't know what her baseline is, but I've still been able to implement into her care and to get compression garments sooner for her. Um, you would ask, like, how do we do this when we're so busy? Uh, I will have to say, typically our clinic, we're usually booked out two to three weeks sometimes before people can get an appointment with us. Um, we're fortunate to have three of us that are lymphedema certified from a therapy standpoint that are PTs and two PTAs. Um, so we do have some flexibility there. Um, Lorian has adjusted some of our referrals coming in so that these are to kind of taking priority, but we'll still have that occasional from a nurse navigator. Hey, this patient, um, they never came to see you. They're having surgery tomorrow. So can you fit them in? Um, and that has happened a couple of times. Um, I think I just had another one this week and that was one there. She was having neoadjuvant and she just kind of 
we dropped off of her radar and now she's thinking about surgery. So um, I think we're seeing her next week before surgery. So it is a challenge, but I would say you have to create the prehab or the program for what's going to work for your clinic. We are fortunate right now that this is working for us. I know we're only six months in, so I think we're really excited with just how it's going and what's going to come as we continue to implement it. I think patients have been really, really excited. Um, it has actually left them more relieved. Like they're like, well, aren't you going to scan me every time I see you? No, 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 this isn't a scale. Well, I, I want you to scan me. Well, it's not time to scan yet. So, um, but I think they're excited because they can see that visual feedback or they can get the buy-in of why they're wearing their garment, or if it's not working, then that can help us to implement other long-term management strategies for lymphedema at home before it becomes a chronic issue. Um, so I think it's ultimately going to be up to their clinic to do what is best for them. Um, but I will have to say having that baseline has been really, really helpful. Um, so we're just kind of scrambling right now to make it work for what works for us. Um, thankfully, it's the first of the year. So that has helped a little bit with referrals being down overall. Um, and cancer patients, really, they are going to meet their deductibles <laughs> regardless because they're getting ready to start their treatment. So I think they're a little bit more open-minded with that. Thank you. And I also, Go ahead, I would like to, yeah, they, um, on a weekly basis, there'll be three or four patients that were coming in five days a week for wrapping, right? Mm -hmm. And that is labor intensive. You're talking a therapist and a tech. So we don't, we don't have that as much anymore. Since we yes. implemented this, we're catching things early. We're getting them in a garment early. We don't have the hour and a half long, takes two people wrapping therapy sessions. So the problem solved itself a little bit. That is true. Good point, Lorian. Um, yeah, it's been pretty, like she said, because we're not getting people when they're as chronic, the amount of visits, the amount of manual labor, it's just so much easier for these patients to get them going and get something addressed. And we're just not having to see them as much. That's wonderful. Thank you. And I know we have a lot of questions that we didn't get to address live. We will follow up with everyone individually including a number of reimbursement questions coming out of our audience in Australia. Um, I know these, these reimbursement questions were US specific, so we will be sure to follow up with our Australian participants who wanna learn more about reimbursement there. And I really wanna thank our panelists, Lorian, Carey, and Chelsea for your wonderful presentations and discussion. Um, please do uh, stay tuned for our next webinar. Um, we are planning an LDEX 101 all about LDEX discussion coming in March, which is Lymphedema Awareness Month. So looking forward to that. And thanks everyone for participating. Thank you for having us.